Thank you. I'm here to challenge you all to how we think about cities and how cities shape us and how we live in cities. Winston Churchill has a famous quote, which is, if we shape our architecture and therein it shapes us. And around us, we have these cities, these cities we live in that become a patchwork quilt of lots of interventions that are conscious or unconscious. And I'm going to challenge you all on how deep a question can solve a problem. And I'll use this quote from E.E. E. Cummings. Always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. So I'm going to give you all five seconds to take a simple test. I don't think you're all expecting a test this afternoon. But we're going to do a quick little study of a children's puzzle. I want, to, I want you all to count how many shapes you see in the next image. You'll have five seconds. It's pretty quick and easy. So, and you all can just yell out when I'm done. Um, tell me how many shapes you see in this next image. Ready? Go. A little louder. Eight. 45 is a high. Okay, how many kids were on the school bus? Anyone? Four. There's actually five kids on the school bus. It's 10 after 10 on the clock. I've shaped your reality by the questions I've asked you. And this happens to us all the time, whether we design, we're designing an I-26 highway, but it happens to be an impact area of 500 acres in the community. To me, 500 acres is more than a highway. So when we talk about the city, when we think about how they're shaped, I think of how I grew up in Rome, New York, which is in the up, upstate of, up, up, of New York. And it's the center point of the Erie Canal. You all remember the song, uh, the Erie Canal song with the mule named Sale. Um, the Erie Canal started at Rome and went east and west from there, and that was pretty much the high point of my hometown. From there, it started, it, it started to die. And as I was a kid, somebody came up with a brilliant idea of replacing the downtown with a Revolutionary War fort. So we got this wooden fort built in our downtown um, that basically replaced all of these images that you see here. All of this stuff is now gone. But we did get this, this wooden fort. Isn't that exciting? I mean, we have these people that uh, you know, dress up as revolutionaries, and we get a Canadian tourist every once in a while. But <laughs> it kind of warped my sense of what cities are. And once with what, not only did the, the fort happen, but we got a uh, pedestrian mall. We've got a couple parking garages. Um, we built a new city hall, a new parking, parking area. Basically, all of this stuff was dead. It was killing the downtown. We got a new mall. We replaced downtown with a new mall. That was spectacular. And a bridge connecting the mall. And our downtown died. Um, we have this great fort if anybody wants to visit it. It's exciting. Um, no one goes there. When I went to architecture school, we were obsessed with the suburban environment, what was happening in the suburbs, these places that were being made, um, these roadways to nowhere that were getting clogged with congestion. Um, and also the human environment that we were making consciously or unconsciously. I had the good fortune of going to another Rome, Rome, Italy, and uh, this is my apartment here, and this is where I went to school, and this is where I ate. And I was able to study a place that had been around thousands and thousands of years and didn't make the same mistakes my hometown did. And it let me think about, well, what are we creating here? And how is my town different from, from Rome, Italy? And so my lesson from this is all cities are like DNA. They're all like people all before you. So if you want to see how I started my life, uh, this is it, when I had hair. And it, this is how I'm going to end up my life. So there's, <laughs> there's not a lot of genetic change I have in this path to becoming my grandfather. Or more importantly, I look at my father pretty much all the time. We have two genetic issues in my family. I'm genetically Italian, so I like to eat. And you can see that on my father. I'm also genetically predisposed to heart disease. So I will have a heart attack. I will have the same heart disease my dad has. But there are things I can do to shape that. I could eat differently. I could exercise more. These are things that we think about with our own families. Are we doing the same with our city? Is Asheville, who is Asheville's grandfather? What does Asheville want to be when it grows up? And do we ask those questions here in Asheville? And I had the good fortune of working for a firm, Public Interest Projects. I, I like to jokingly call them the BASF of downtown Asheville. No one knows who they are, but they know their products. The orange peel, uh, mail props, salsas, ombras. Um, and they was founded by Julian Price in the upper left here as a, a, a for-profit real estate development company. So this is one of our projects before and after. So we do the physical buildings, but we also look at the economics behind it. And this brings me to another lesson, which is Pat Whalen. I've learned a lot from Pat. Pat's Julian's trustee who runs the company. He's the president of the company. And for Pat, it's always getting to know the numbers. And what's fascinating about what he did is he challenges what government is. And I'll just go ahead and read this bottom line. Incorporation is the forming of a new corporation. 
A corporation may be a business, a nonprofit organization, a sports club, or a government or a new city or town. Basically, all of us are shareholders in this corporation called Asheville or Buncombe County. And so what we, we have here is a finite bubble of land, and we're in control over what it looks like. That leads to what is land, how does it produce a uh, tax base? So this is, this is another one of our buildings. And when we fixed this building, it went from $300,000 of tax base to $11 million of tax base. What that represents is a 3,500% tax penalty for our work. Or another way of looking at it, that's a 3,500% increase in our community's wealth. And these are conscious choices. How do we get more of this in our community? Another way of looking at it from a, on a per acre basis, this is land to bunk, or value to P Buncombe County. So a, a city resident is producing about $1,700 in county taxes, where a county resident is producing $1,200. You bring the mall into this, and now you see some, why somebody would do the mall. This is $8,000 an acre of county wealth versus the residential. And what we were saying is, well, why stop there? Let's bring downtown into it. And now you see where the mall is down here in the center of the chart, and this is our building at $250,000 an acre. Why are we not choosing to do more of this stuff? Why are we not building more of downtown? Another way of thinking of it, um, this is the Walmart. This is our building. This is my house. This is my wife, Caroline. She's back there. Our two dogs, Bill and Susie, they think they're lions. They're a little weird. Um, and when... When people see the Walmart, they get really excited about the $20 million of value, and we're just like, well, okay, well, how do you make that compare to my house? Caroline and I pay $2,000 in taxes on an annual basis. We're on a tenth of an acre, so if a one-acre cookie cutter dropped into West Asheville, um, we'd be producing $20,000 an acre of, county, of community wealth, right? If you take that same acre and drop it into the Walmart, it's 34 acres, they're only producing 6,500 an acre. Or you take a look at downtown, and it's $634,000 an acre. Why are we not building more of our community wealth? I presented this in California, and I said to them, I'm like, look, y'all, you're farmers. You'll totally understand this. If you only had an acre of land to grow something, what would you rather grow, wheat, soybeans, or marijuana? You know, you grow the pot. You get more bang for your buck. I mean, it's legal there, so why not? You know, it's, but they understood that. You know, let's remove me because you're saying, you know, Joe, you don't sell anything. And again, the misnomer is we focus on that $77 million. The reality of it, the city only gets a portion of a portion back. So the total tax take of the city on the Walmart is about $51,000 an acre. Compare that to just the property taxes of our building downtown. You add the retail taxes, now you're cooking with gas, and everybody's concerned about jobs, jobs per acre, well, 74 versus 6. And the more that you stack these things up, one of my friends calls this next slide the money ball shot. Just put, put all the numbers down side by side why would you choose one versus the other? Thank you. And our building also has a residential per acre. So when we talk about mixed uses, this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about density helping cities, this is what we, we've learned. All across the city, when you mash these things up, we see that as you start getting into two-story buildings, even in small towns, little main streets, why, did, why don't we build those anymore? You start to see four and five, or four and five times, actually up to ten times, what you get in a Walmart or a mall. So um, the, the lesson basically is, when we talk about cars, we don't say what the miles per tank is, do we? No, we say what the miles per gallon is. But in the, when we say miles per tank, we should all be driving Ford F-150s. There's 650 miles per tank. But we do that all the time with architecture. We talk about the big number. We don't talk about its efficiency. We don't talk about how it meets our community's goals. If I change the question to the miles per gallon, the numbers change. I didn't change the cars and we should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. Sorry to your Prius owners, but a 55 technology beats 2011. So the way that we apply numbers on buildings leads to different questions, and this isn't scary math that I'm doing here. This is actually pretty simple stuff. <laughs> it's, it's fifth grade division. It's embarrassing, but what's happening behind all of this, the reason why the development community builds what it's building is because of behavioral economics. There are things built into the system that, that reward the developer. So this is you have two values in land. You have the value of the land. You have the value of the building on top of it. We removed the building and just looked at the land and said, what's the value per acre? And so you'd expect it to all look like this, that everybody's land is the same value per acre at $15,000 an acre. But looking over here, we said, well, what's going on here that it's $15,000, and as soon as you cross the street, it goes up to $35,000 an acre. And the tax assessor was sitting in the front row. She goes, you don't understand. I said, what don't I understand? She goes, well, the more land you have, the lower the value. 
So we said, well, even with three quarters of a mile of roadway and three quarters of a mile of roadway, that all that infrastructure, you're going to give me a discount rate? And she's like, yeah. I said, or another way of putting it, if I do stuff in the downtown, you're going to penalize me. And she goes, yeah. And she's like, well, that's our standard. I said, where'd you get it from? Did, did Moses deliver it to you on a tablet? You know, it's, <laughs> if, you've, if you've got something that's, that's harming you or steering the market and it's hurting you, change it. So another way of thinking of it is, let's say I had a hot dog stand out on the street out on, on Biltmore. If it cost me $10 to make a hamburger and a dollar to make a hot dog, yet I sold that hamburger for a dollar on the street and transferred that cost over to the hot dog, how do you think the consumer would respond? Would they buy more hamburgers at a dollar or more hot dogs at $10? They'd buy more hamburgers, of course. You know, these aren't invisible forces making us make these choices. The game is rigged. And th we have a lot of policies that basically shoot ourselves in the foot. It costs a lot to service suburban environments, yet we're getting very little cash revenue out of it. So what I've learned in all of this process is that we are making deliberate choices, that cities are for us people who have feet, and that we shape our place and the place shapes us. When we talk about this sprawling cartoon of the lam American landscape, in a way it's kind of sad that this is a cartoon, but it's also become our real place. This is San Antonio, and it's, and it's horrendous. So I'll close, I'll close with a quote from Leon Creer, who's one of my favorite architects. And he says that we must think of every building in the city as if you were thought of building one piece of the whole world. If we took that care to architecture in our cities, we would be thinking differently about the policies that we put in place, and we'd incentivize the good stuff and not the bad stuff. Thank you.